Good evening. Am I up and running? <laughs> Is that better? A bit more, please, Trevor. Lovely. Thank you. That's better. Uh, good evening. Lovely and warm and dry in here. <laughs> um, very warm welcome to you all and to our guest tonight, Philip St. Lawrence, who is a very lively speaker and a very good friend to St. Barb. So I'll introduce him in a moment, but I have a few things just to tell you about. Um, one is that we've had the most amazing half term at St. Barb. We've had loads of young people in and out, loads of activities going on, and um, it's been just wonderful seeing the museum so lively and well populated. Uh, we have a lot of workshops going on now, between now and Christmas. So if you haven't already got one of these leaflets, they're on the table at the back in the foyer. So please do take one and think about coming along to one of the workshops. You need to book early because they're very popular. Um, the Parallel Lives exhibition is still on. People are finding it very interesting. Eight women artists and uh, a great variety, even though it's from the same uh, period, uh, early, early uh, 20th century. Yeah. Um, and then in the new year, that will be followed by an exhibition called Planting Ideas, which is quite literally about uh, the history of collecting and cataloguing plants and the art will be contemporary art about the science of botany so it'll be very interesting very different and uh, i hope you'll all enjoy that um, and the last thing i have to say about uh, what's happening is that there's no talk at the beginning of, uh, of december because we will have our christmas party which is on the first of december over in st barb and we invite you to share mince pies and mulled wine with us. Start off the festive season. Right, that brings me to Philip, who's with us today. He's a very lively speaker. He has recently been uh, speaking with Cunard on the Vic Queen Victoria. Um, he's done lots and lots of other cruise talks. And uh, we're very lucky to have him living near us in Sway. And he comes to to talk to St. Barb. So please welcome Philip St. Lawrence. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. In the next 45 minutes, we are going to together relive one of the great moments of British and indeed European history. It's a story of triumph, but also of tragedy. We are going to relive it. So I do advise you, hang on to your seats, hang on to your tissues or handkerchiefs. It's going to get very emotional. And I did this on the Queen Elizabeth one time. I was in tears on stage, and half the people afterwards said they were in tears too. So I have warned you. But it's one of the great stories, and let's relive it together. Imagine, if you will, it is the summer of 1805. Napoleon Bonaparte is halfway through a 20-year spree of brutalizing much of Europe and rampaging across Europe. And now, in the summer of 1805, he is intent upon invading Great Britain. He'd said, famously, give me control of the channel for five hours and we shall be masters of the universe. But one man, one man had stood in his way. And we all know who it is, don't we? It is, of course, Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson. And Nelson was known throughout the international community. He'd stood up, he'd kept control of the channel just about, with the help of wonderful other admirals as well. And because we're in Lymington, we should mention specifically Admiral Cornwallis, who, of course, had the squadron at Brest and helped magnificently also to protect the channel. He's a local man. We should always remember good Cornwallis. Nelson is internationally known. He had won the great Battle of the Nile, in which he destroyed the, the, the French fleet at, uh, in 1798 off Alexandria. He'd won the great Battle of Copenhagen in 1801. He is recognized. He's an absolute hero. He has, of course, uh, lost his right arm. He's got a scarred right eye. He's only five foot seven, but he is, he is a magnificent man, has real, real charisma. And so what has happened in this summer of 1805? Villeneuve, the French commander, 
also the overall commander for the enemy fleet, if I may say that, uh, meaning this combined Spanish and French fleets, had sailed across the, the Atlantic trying to lose Nelson and then raced back to try to take control of the channel just as Napoleon Bonaparte had ordered him. But he'd found that Cornwallis and others were blocking the English Channel, and he'd taken refuge at Ferrol. And so he couldn't make it and take control. And realizing that the threat for this moment in time was off, what does Nelson do? He comes back to England. And what do we find? We find that on the 19th of August, 1805, he lands at Portsmouth in, we all know, a wonderful HMS Victory. He's greeted like the hero he is. Ladies and gentlemen, he'd been two years at sea. I don't know about you, but if I go two weeks at sea, I come back and it takes me three days to get my legs back. He'd been two years at sea. Emma Hamilton, who he absolutely adores, and she adores him, can't wait to see the man she loves so much. He lands at Portsmouth. He's mobbed. He's this charismatic hero. He is mobbed by many, and he makes his way back to, uh, back to London. And when he goes, he finds England is in a state of tense preparation. Nothing like this, ladies and gentlemen, has happened since the summer of 1588, when England, mighty England, faced the wrath of the Spanish Armada and succeeded in beating it off, helped, of course, by a storm at the end. And nothing like it again will happen, as we all know, until the summer of 1940. So what do we find? We find there are 74 Martello Towers, like this one in Eastbourne, that have been built, that many of us will know and love. There is a dad's army of 400,000 men. And there are 800 fishing boats that have been equipped, ladies and gentlemen, with guns, big guns, with another 25,000 men ready to, to man those. England is in a state of tension. And on the other side of the channel, Napoleon Bonaparte is at Boulogne, and he's there with 200,000 troops and 2,000 ships and barges ready to bring him across. He's sitting there at Boulogne, ready to come across and do his worst. William Pitt is sitting there in Downing Street, managing things just like Churchill did in 1940. And of course, what then happens is that we find Nelson spending time in Downing Street, and, and he goes, of course, to see his beloved Emma Hamilton. She is beautiful. Emma was born in the same year as HMS Victory was launched, 1765. She's now 40 years of age. She's beautiful. I think of the words of Coco Chanel. We all know what Coco said, didn't we? Don't we? She said, you can look gorgeous, at 30, charming at 40, and irresistible for the rest of your life. I always think of my daughter when I say that. And my wife, of course. I have to say that in case she might be at the back. And, and uh, Emma hasn't seen the man she adores for two whole years. And he can't wait to be with her. And eventually they get together at Merton House. The house that, this wonderful country house that he'd bought in 1802 for the princely sum of, can we guess, 9,000 pounds. Today it'd be worth, I suppose you'd pay about 5 million. And it's on the edge of Wandsworth Common. Doesn't exist now, of course. And when he gets to Merton, she clasps him, the man she adores. She can't wait to be together with him. And what do we find? We find that as they are spending time together, suddenly on the 5th of September, I'm sorry, on the 2nd of September, Captain Blackwood, who served with Nelson on many occasions, he arrives in a great state of, what should we say, anxiety, sense of urgency. He arrives at Merton on his ship, the Euralis. And when he arrives at Merton, he says, Sir, I have the most urgent news. Villeneuve, has gone now to Cadiz, and he's been blocked there by Admiral Collingwood and Admiral Calder, and he and the, the combined French and Spanish fleets, which, ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you, are the second and third largest navies in the world, are there at Cadiz. This is music to Nelson's ears. 
He thinks, my God, we have an opportunity. Now at last, perhaps, we can go, we can blockade Cadiz, and we can finally, may I use this terrible term, take them out. It's a terrible term to use, forgive me. And Nelson's, Nelson is never one to buck on opportunity. And he's an optimist. What did Winston Churchill say? The pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. We all know that, don't we? And Nelson was very much the opportunist. And he was also fearless. When he was at school, there's a lovely story told of Nelson. When he was a schoolboy, he had a particularly strict schoolmaster. Do you know what he did? He went to this master's house and he stole pears from his garden. And when he was asked, Nelson, why did you behave like this? He's only 10 years old at the time. And he said, well, all the other boys were too scared, so I decided I'd do it. Quite fearless. But very charismatic. And this news reaches him. And when he and uh, Cap dear Captain Blackwood, they got on so well together, he adores Nelson, his beloved chief, they're together. Nelson actually begins to outline in his mind and to Blackwood the tactics that he'd employ. He's got to take on these combined second and third biggest fleets in the world. He needs tactics to do it. Nelson was a tactical genius, as we shall see. But of course, it is Emma who wants to spend uh, time with him. And uh, uh, Captain Blackwood is, 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 is there, and we see Captain Blackwood. He spends time there. He enjoys spending time there, and he spends time at Merton as well. But of course, we now go to uh, Emma. And Emma, when she hears this news that Nelson's got to go so quickly, she is she's bereft. She's, and she, she'd expected to see him for a long time. And she says, my God, she says, we've had only 14 days together. 14 days of bliss. That's all it is. And so, what then happens? Nelson uh, uh, Nelson goes on the 12th of, uh, uh, 12th of September, he goes to, to Downing Street and he sees William Pitt and he sees Lord Castlereagh as well. And when he gets there, there's one other man sitting in the waiting room. Can we guess who it is? He sees Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington. And all this while he's trying to spend evenings with, with Emma but he's having to go to London as well and spend a lot of time in London planning how to stop Villeneuve at Cadiz. And so Wellesley and Nelson have an interesting conversation. It lasts about 40, 45 minutes, and they get on reasonably well. That is the last day in London anyway. That day is uh, Thursday, the 12th of September. But then we come to Friday the 13th of September. Who can possibly forget this date? It is the last day when dear Emma and Nelson will be together. They take the sacraments together. He gives her a betrothal ring. And eventually, what do we find? We find that uh, N Nelson, that night, he goes and he kneels at his little daughter's uh, bedside, little Horatia. She's four years old. She doesn't even know, ladies and gentlemen, that Nelson is her daddy. He kneels and he prays and he has a very, very tearful farewell to dear Emma that night of Friday the 13th of September. And then what happens? He's given her a betrothal ring as well. It's terribly, terribly romantic. But then what happens is that, of course, it's time for him to go. And he does. He goes down to Portsmouth. The victory has been, well, smartened up, shall we say. There hasn't been a lot of time. And he sets off from Portsmouth. In fact, he was due to set off there. But I tell a lie, because he couldn't actually. The crowds were so great that he has to take his carriage onto the beach at South Sea, which many of us will know at South Sea. And we're told that what happened on that Sunday, the 15th of September, ladies and gentlemen, people came out of their bathing huts. Do you remember bathing huts before our day? Yeah? And they came out to wish him well. They raised their hats. They sang Rule Britannia on the beach. And Nelson is mobbed as he goes and he takes a rowing boat, a little tiny barge, out to join the victory just off the beach at South Sea. And then what do we find? 
we find that as Nelson leaves, uh, he writes emotionally uh, to Emma. Emma has written to him. She said, when you are back, we will, I shall be in paradise, because when you are at Merton with me, it is paradise. What wonderful romantic words that she wrote. She was a lady of verse too, as many of us will recognize. But Nelson, as he goes away, he meets up with Cornwallis, off breast, and he, Cornwallis then gives him back some of his ships that he'd given to Cornwallis on his way in. And he takes them out trying to strengthen his squadron to go out and join Admiral Collingwood at Cadiz. And as he goes past Brest, he writes emotionally to Emma. And we can see the words here. We can actually see the words. I entreat you, dear Emma, that you will cheer up. And I love these words. Don't we love these words? That we will look forward to many, many happy years and be surrounded by our children's children. He's very romantic, and she is too. But what is about to happen? will change the course of history. Because Nelson now races down the Bay of Biscay, and he gets there, and eventually he arrives here, off Cadiz. And when he arrives at Cadiz, he finds dear Admiral Collingwood there already blockading Villeneuve with the entire French and Spanish fleets inside Cadiz Harbour. And those of us who've been to Cadiz and love Cadiz will know it's a huge harbour, and there's plenty of room for them too. Nelson blockades it, but he puts his own fleet now 50 miles back, 50 miles back over the horizon so that they cannot be seen. And when he does that, we know that um, the, the French, uh, Villeneuve has officials up the famous Tavira Tower, which is at the top, in the center of the picture, the Tavira Tower, and they are watching to see him, but they can't see him because he's 50 miles away. At the same time, Villeneuve is a worried man. He has meetings with his colleagues in Cadiz. They think, should we go out? We know he's out there somewhere. Admiral Federico Gravina, who is the Spanish commander, the Spanish fleet, he says these words. He says, it would be utter madness. We all know Nelson's reputation. He'll annihilate us. But Villeneuve, ladies and gentlemen, is under orders from a certain Napoleon Bonaparte. He's expected to go out and do the business, but he is running scared. Meanwhile, Nelson places Captain Blackwood and the Euryalus just off Cadiz itself, within sight, and they can see Captain Blackwood and he can see them. And in his fast frigates, he's keeping a beady eye on what's happening in Cadiz. And the moment that Villeneuve dares to break out, he will send signals back back all the way, 50 miles, to, uh, to Nelson, which in the event, when it happens, will take two whole hours to do. Now, on the 29th and the 30th of September, Nelson, as he so often did, he did this at Copenhagen as well, and at the Nile, he calls in his captains on two nights running, and he sits down in the cabin of the victory, and he explains to them his tactics. And what does he say? He says, gentlemen, we are going to conduct what he called a pell-mell battle. Now, pell-mell battle was Nelson's term for getting in amongst the enemy. He said, we're not going to exchange broadsides. If the enemy are like this, we're going to go in at right angles. It'll be dangerous because as we go in, they will be able to fire their broadsides at us. And because our broadsides are pointing this way, we won't be able to return fire for approximately 25 minutes. But when we do go through the line, we're going to cut through the line. We're going to separate the rear from the center of the enemy fleet and then the center from the vanguard. And with luck, the vanguard will go off to sea and be out of the battle for at least a couple of hours. His captains sit around the table. They listen to this tactical genius. They are inspired by it. Nelson was the most inspirational commander. He says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get amongst them, and with the superior rate and weight of English gunnery, we are going to, we're going to annihilate the enemy. He fills them with confidence. And when he's done this, he leaves them. Oh, by the way, I should say the 29th of September was his birthday. He was, can we guess, 47 years old. But afterwards, 
He inspires them. He writes to all of them as well. He not only gives them their orders, ladies and gentlemen, he writes to them as well. So each captain carries in his pocket a card giving their orders. And he says these famous words. He says, no captain can do very wrong as long as he gets his vessel alongside that of the enemy. Get in amongst them and give them hell. He then writes again to dear Emma. We can see his words here. And it was called the Nelson Touch, this charismatic commander. I wonder how many heads of industry today in Great Britain have this charisma as they motivate their managerial sales teams. And then, of course, we see these wonderful words. Look at what he says to Admiral Collingwood. Collingwood, ladies and gentlemen, is 10 years older than Nelson. Nelson's captain on the victory is 10 years younger. We all know who? Captain Thomas Masterman Hardy. All six foot four of him. A lovely man had the greatest respect for Nelson. They'd served together many times. But his second in command is actually, for the fleet, is Admiral Collingwood. And Collingwood, in the Royal Sovereign, is 10 years older. He's a strict disciplinarian, but not too strict. Do you know what I mean? He's a lovely man, Collingwood. And what I, he hates drunkenness, by the way. But what I love about Collingwood, he has his dog. His dog is called Bounce, and he takes Bounce with him on the Royal Sovereign. Now, whether, whether Bounce was actually there at Trafalgar, we simply don't know. But he was with Collingwood a lot of the time. And do you know what he'd do, Collingwood? He, the strict disciplinarian admiral, he'd sing to Bounce when Bounce looked unhappy and Bounce would wag his tail. And when he went in a rowing boat to go out to one of the other vessels, Bounce would he, well, he'd swim along in the sea beside the boat. Bounce eventually died in 1810, the same year as his master, dear Admiral Collingwood. But look what Collingwood did. Look at Nelson's motivation. He says to Collingwood these great words. He says, no man has more confidence in another than I have in you. Ladies and gentlemen, how many managing directors or sales directors use that sort of language on their, in their teams? Wouldn't that be motivational? I think it's absolutely tremendous. No wonder these men will lay down their lives for Nelson. And then, what do we see? We see dawn on the 11th of, uh, sorry, the 19th of October. Villeneuve, finally, after having almost mutinous meetings in Cadiz, he says to his men, we are going. We have to obey Napoleon's orders. We're going out and we're going to do battle. And go out, they do. And when they come out of Cadiz, they turn to the southeast, heading towards the Straits of Gibraltar. Yeah. Blackwood gives the signal. As I said earlier, it takes two whole hours flashing f um, signals by flag to reach Nelson 50 miles over the horizon. But the moment Nelson gets it, he says, right, we are on. We're absolutely on. Nelson has written again to Emma. He said these words, how I do idolize you. May God, well, she's written to him actually. Let me read you these words. How I do idolize you. May God send you victory and home to your Emma, Horatio, as Paradise Merton. And she writes, they're exchanging letters all the time. So I, like my wife and daughter on the phone, it, it never stops. But, but, <laughs> but they're exchanging correspondence all the time um, to, to one another. And so Nelson says, right, the chase is on. And he now moves and the fleets begin. They just begin to close, close uh, together. We come to the eve of Trafalgar. Ladies and gentlemen, just look at the difference. The combined Spanish and French fleets, they have 33 warships. They have almost 50% more firepower than has Nelson. Almost 50%. I mean, I tell you, that if we take the combined firepower of all the cannons here, all the cannons on both sides of the fleet, it comes, ladies and gentlemen, to a staggering amount. It is 13 times the firepower of the cannons of the combined forces at the Battle of Waterloo 10 years later in 1815, as we all know. It's an immense amount. And these ships have between uh, approximately 35 and 130 guns uh, on each ship. It's an immense firepower. And what is about to happen is one of the greatest naval battles in history, as we shall see. Nelson, of course, is on board the Victory, as we all know. And the Victory is carrying uh, 50 tons of beef. 
It's carrying 11,000 tons of beer, would you believe? They're going to get through seven tons of gunpowder. It's quite phenomenal. Just the victory alone is carrying all of this. And as they get closer, Nelson now writes a final letter to dear Emma. There's a wonderful lady called Jenny, Jenny who lives in this area. And a couple of years ago, Jenny, lovely lady, was so kind, she gave me an exact replica. And this is the picture of the replica of Nelson's final letter to dear Emma Hamilton. Let me read you a little bit, if I may, because he writes this letter on the eve of Trafalgar, in fact, on the 19th, and he writes it just off Cadiz. Let me read it to you. My dearest, beloved Emma, the dear friend of my bosom, the signal has been made that the enemy's combined fleet are coming out of port. We have very little wind, so that I have no hope of pursuing them before tomorrow. May the great God of battles crown my endeavors with success at all events, I will take care that my name shall ever be most dear to you and Horatia, both of whom I love as much as my own life and as my last writing before the battle will be to you. So I hope in God that I shall live to finish my letter. Ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you, Nelson leaves the letter open. He does not finish it because he has to attend to more important things. He leaves it open on his desk in his cabin. When he writes this letter, precisely 48 hours later, the victory will be breaking the line of the French and Spanish fleet. And so it is that he goes to bed in his... He had a cot, Nelson. He's only five foot seven, and of course he's one arm. But so he has a cot... And he has this picture of dear Emma actually in his cabin. This was taken actually in the victory. And we can see Emma's verses to him as well. She, as I said, is something of a poet as well. Nelson is getting little sleep. He's, he's fearless, but he's also anxious because he knows that so much rests upon this. I should say that Napoleon by this time had actually taken away his troops from Boulogne. I must be fair. So the immediate invasion threat across the channel has passed. However, if there is always a chance that Napoleon could come back and could take control of the channel again, so Nelson has to win this battle, and especially if he wants to take command of the sea. And what do we find? On the eve of battle, on the Monday, the 21st of October, Nelson believes, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a good day. Why? Because it is the day of his village fair at Burnham Thorpe in Norfolk. It's going to be, he believes, a lucky day. And what happens? Nelson is up early. Uh, he's up very early, and uh, he, he's, he's, when men see him uh, on deck, he has uh, gilded buttons, 36 of them, and uh, um, uh, gold buttons as well. And when they see him on deck, they say, Sir, shouldn't you be taking a, a, a rear stand? Shouldn't you go below? Because after all, you will be marked out by the French marksmen. Nelson says, No, I'm not having it. I'm staying on deck where I belong, because he believed in motivating his people. And I should say one other thing. Nelson at this time, is, he's mixing with his men. He's determined that they should have high morale. On board the Victory, breakfast is taken. There are 822 men and boys, and that includes, ladies and gentlemen, 149 Marines as well. On board the Royal Sovereign, Collingwood addresses his men. Can we feast our eyes, ladies and gentlemen? Can we all see on Collingwood's wonderful words? Now, gentlemen, you can read it on the slide. What, again, wonderful motivational words. And Collingwood, sir, if you are listening from up there, please know we are still speaking of your great feats, even now in 2023. And so what now happens? At 10 a.m. on the victory, the guns are made ready. The surgeons are ready. The monkey, uh, the, the, the monkey boys, the powder monkeys are doing their bit. Everything that can be slashed away for the great battle to come is being slashed away. Pictures, furniture, hammocks. The surgeons are cutting their knives, sharpening them. They know this is going to be the most terrible battle. Guns are being prepared. 
And at this time, the, the French, the, the, they're also singing Hearts Vote. We know they sang Rule Britannia as the fleets are closing. But the wind behind Nelson, ladies and gentlemen, is a slow wind. It's just three knots. They're closing. Can we imagine the tension? They're closing just so soon, but they're now within sight, and they know that this enormous battle where the French and Spanish outnumber them so hugely, it's going to happen. Men are writing last letters to their loved ones. They are, some are praying, but Nelson is keeping them all up. And as they sing, they sing Rule Britannia and so on, Nelson now withdraws to his cabin. He writes a prayer. May I read this prayer to you? Because, ladies and gentlemen, I think you will agree it is very poignant. Nelson writes these words. May the great God, which I worship, grant to my country and for the benefit of Europe in general a great and glorious victory. And may humanity after victory be the predominant feature in the British fleet. Let us remember how appropriate and pertinent those particular words will prove to be. Nelson then does something rather emotional. He calls in Captain Hardy, as all this is going on, and dear Captain Blackwood into his cabin on the victory. And he asks them to witness a codicil to his will, a wish clause, that in the event of his death, dear, dear Emma, who he loves so much, and Horatia, will be looked after. And they witness this codicil to his will. As they leave, Nelson shakes Hardy's hand and he shakes Captain Blackwood's hands. And he says some very strange words to Captain Blackwood. He shakes him by the hand and he says these words, God bless you, Blackwood. I shall never see you again. These words are prophetic. And some historians believe that Nelson had been to a clairvoyant or to a tarot card reader or someone, somebody of that ilk and believed that he was going to die. Blackwood is left pretty shaken, as we can imagine, by these words. And then what do we find? We find that the fleets are closing. They are very, very close indeed. And Actually, Collingwood's line is the first, slightly a mile, they're a mile apart, to head towards breaking the French and Spanish line. He's going to break them, and the royal sovereign begins to move in. But before it does, we all know what happens. Nelson issues the most famous signal, arguably, in maritime history. England confides, he says to Mr. Pascoe, his signalman, that every man will do his duty. Mr. Pascoe says, sir... If you wish me to send this out quickly, may I have your kind permission to change the word confides to expects? Nelson says, yes, of course. England expects every man will do his duty. I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, before this gets too serious, am I allowed to speak to you on a lighter note? I have this brass plaque in our kitchen above the washing up area at home. <laughs> yes, I do. It's true. Yes. Sometimes I ask myself whether I should take it upstairs, but I won't go there. Um, but uh, Nelson sends out this signal. And there are, and it's, of course, it's quite fashionable now to knock bits of British history, as we all know. It's quite widely done. And I've heard it knocked on the BBC and others, saying, well, of course, this was a frivolous signal. No, it was not. S serious historians know that the reaction as Captain Blackwood on the Uriela said, was, was, Blackwood uses this word, sublime. People were inspired. Nelson believed in motivation. Do you know what he called his officers? He called his officers, we band of brothers. Why? Because he knew his Shakespeare. He idolized Shakespeare's Henry V. He'd done the same at the Battle of the Nile, 1798. He called them, we, we band of brothers, all his officers. He knew the words. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he that sheds his blood with me this day shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition. I won't go on, this isn't a Henry V talk. But Nelson loved this. He called, he called his men my noble lads, just as Henry V referred at Agincourt to his men as my fellows. What does he say? Fellows, let's go. 
Of course, Nelson would be in trouble today. Am I allowed to say this? He couldn't say England expects every man to do his duty. Oh, no, he'd have to say England expects every person to do their duty. Must get this right. I shall say no more that's contentious, I promise you. And so we see in this wonderful painting, we see Collingwood going towards and breaking the line. And we're told that when Collingwood leads in the Royal Sovereign, he has those 24, 25 minutes in which he cannot return far. And so this is the most dangerous time. And one of his officers said that when they did get amongst them and they exchanged fire, there was hell on some of the French and Spanish ships. Do you know what his words were? He said, I looked across the Spanish ship and the captain standing on the edge, as I am now, he said a cannonball hit him. The top half of his body, his torso, went over the edge, leaving his legs up to his waist in his breeches standing on the deck. Can we imagine the slaughter that is about to take place? A total of 60 warships, averaging almost 100 cannons each. It is phenomenal. And as we can see, Collingwood's line breaks the line, and he is, for the moment, and the dangerous point, ladies and gentlemen, is before his second and third, the Belial, for instance, could come up behind him and help him as he's surrounded by ships. And he was surrounded. At one point, before anybody could catch up and help him, he's surrounded by eight enemy warships, including the Fagu, the Santa Ana, and they are taking it is really what Nelson knew would be, a pell-mell battle. And then look what is happening here. Let us look at this quote from another sailor on board the Royal Sovereign. It is ferocious. And on the decks, we know, there is absolute slaughter, not to mention a tremendous din. As all these cannons are firing, the noise could be heard, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this if I may, 20 miles north along the coastline at Cadiz and at Cape Trafalgar itself. When I gave this talk on the Queen Elizabeth, we came to that point, 20 miles south of Cadiz, 21 miles southwest of Cape Trafalgar. And I went on deck. I said, where's the captain? Tell the captain of the Queen Elizabeth to announce we are at the exact point where the Battle of Trafalgar took place. I got no response. Isn't it terrible? I got no response. But he didn't hear me, obviously. But I wanted to make a speech there and there on the decks. We were on the exact waters. And then what happens? We can see what happens. In Nelson's line, he goes and he, Nelson is after um, the Royal Sovereign. The Royal Sovereign has now broken the line at approximately uh, 12, uh, 12 15. Nelson is within range of the French and Spanish cannons at 12.04, but he cannot return fire until, until 12.24 on this day, uh, Monday, the 21st of October. He has to sit there and just take a pummeling. His broadsides are really open to up when he actually crashes through the line at 12.45. And then a real pell-mell battle begins to take place. One of the ships that Nelson finds himself up against is the French ship called the Redoubtable. And it is captained by a, 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 an excellent captain. We must pay him huge credit. His name is Captain Luca, and he has musketeers up in the rigging. And I think we all know where this great story is going. Nelson is on deck with Hardy. It is ferocious. The victory, at almost no range at all, is exchanging cannon fire. May I tell you, the victory has 100 cannons approximately. It can those cannons can penetrate oak to a depth of two feet at a range of one mile. But now, they are literally 20 yards, the length of a cricket pitch, from one another. In fact, the masts at some points become entangled. Can we imagine what is happening? They are firing through the ports, through the gun holes. And at one point, Captain Luca's men try to board the victory. They are held back by 149 Marines on board the victory. And in the ferocious melee that takes place, dear Captain Adair, leading the Marines, he is killed. And by this time, Mr. Pasco, who'd given that famous signal, he has had a cannonball seriously wound him. Nelson's secretary, Mr. Scott, has been killed also by a cannonball, and so is Captain Hardy's secretary. There is literally slaughter on the top deck. 
Nelson and Hardy, we can picture it. They're walking along together, urging the men on. And Nelson knows he's a target, but he said to Emma, I will be at the front of my men, just like Henry V was. And, and he knows, but he doesn't give up at all. And at one point, a bullet from Musket lands on the buckle of Captain Hardy's shoe. A bullet. And Hardy, and Hardy listens to his chief. His, Nelson turns to him and says, these words, he says, well, this is too warm work to last for long, Hardy. But they carry on regardless. And then, what happens? At 1.15 approximately, as this slaughter is taking place on the decks, and the cannon fire is ferocious from very short range, a bullet now hits Nelson in the left shoulder, it goes down through his pulmonary artery and lodges itself in his spine, approximately at the sixth vertebra. Hardy looks round, and he sees his beloved chief is lying on the deck. There are copious amounts of blood. He's not dead. Hardy, he shouldn't have been shocked. Perhaps it was almost inevitable, but he is shocked. Nelson still just alive, and he has the presence of mind to pull out a handkerchief and put it across his face so as not to demoralize his men. He's taken below. Hardy follows him below. And in this picture, we can see on the victory the exact spot that to this day, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know at Portsmouth, is marked by this brass plaque just here in the bottom right part of the picture. It is a terrible scene. And when Nelson goes below, he says to Mr. Beatty, the surgeon, he says, there's nothing you can do for me. I can feel the blood. He whispers. He can just whisper. He says, I can feel the blood gushing through my lungs. There's nothing you can do for me. See to the others. And at this point, we know Mr. Beatty had already carried out 11 amputations. 11. What is happening on the gun deck? May I share this? We have a crew of eight working in the most terrible conditions. Some are getting their heads blown off because many of the cannibals go into the gun deck. There is smoke everywhere. There is ferocious noise. But the rate of fire of the British vessels was approximately... What, every cannon could be fired just over 60 seconds. So they had a rate of return of fire a little over 60 seconds. And the Victory has almost 100 guns. So every second... Can we imagine this? Every second of every minute, over a period of four hours duration for the battle, a cannon on the victory alone is going off. Now let's imagine, supposing we heard a cannon go off just outside the, these, these windows here. We'd all jump out of our seats, wouldn't we? But imagine, ladies and gentlemen, a cannon going off every single second for four hours. Men lost their hearing. But the victory is only one of 60 warships. This is the most ferocious battle. I don't know about you. I can hardly imagine the degree of ferocity. The noise was heard, as I say, 20 miles north on the beaches of Cadiz. And the battle continues to rage. This wonderful painting depicts uh, the French flagship, the Vieux Centaur, on which Villeneuve is based. It's being pummeled and dismasted. And of course, Villeneuve eventually will surrender. And other ships also are now having to surrender because the English, the British, I should say, are carrying out Nelson's Pelmer battle. Their rate and their weight of fire was just simply so superior. But what is happening to Nelson? Nelson is he's dying, and he knows he's dying. All around Nelson, it is a vision from hell. Mr. Beatty, the surgeon, is trying to see to so many others as well. We think of the surgeons covered from head to foot in blood. We think of the cries of wounded dying men. We think of Captain Thomas Maine, who sang Rule Britannia as his arm was being amputated. We think of young William Rivers, ladies and gentlemen, who called out for his son, whose leg was being amputated, father and son, serving together. His son replies with these words, I am here, Father. Nothing is the matter. I have only lost my leg, and that in a good cause. Those are the words his father hears his son beckoning back. 
At 2.30, Hardy goes back down below. Hardy's still trying to run the battle on deck. By this time, other ships like the Temeraire have caught up and inflicted terrific damage on the Redoubtable. The Redoubtable at one point loses, eventually loses 80% of its crew. Approximately 600 men, Frenchmen, are dead or dying once the Temeraire catches up, with the, which with the victory can inflict this damage. Hardy goes below at 2.30 p.m. He sees his beloved chief dying. He says to Nelson, Sir, we have taken 14 of the enemy. The victory will be ours. Nelson whispers back, I had vouched for 20. Ever the more confident optimist that he was. Again, Nelson whispers to Hardy, Look after Emma. Look after Horatia. Take a locket of my hair, Hardy. Keep it and give it to dear Emma. Meanwhile, the surgeon, Mr. Beatty, and Reverend Scott, too, are fanning him with a paper fan, and they're giving him lemonade, wine, anything that will try to, try to hydrate him, rehydrate him. But Nelson says it's, it's pointless. See to the others. And then Hardy is called back on deck. Why? Because Rear Admiral Dumanois, who led the vanguard, do you remember? Nelson has split the vanguard from the center. He's now managed, after an hour and a half, two hours, to turn around, and he's come back into the fray. Hardy has to go back up on deck, and as Churchill would have said, finish the job. The victory isn't secure yet. It's looking like it, but it's not confirmed, particularly as Dumanois is coming back. But after 50 minutes, 50 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, Hardy returns down below. Nelson issues his famous words. Kiss me, Hardy. Hardy kneels. He kisses his beloved chief on the cheek. And he reassures Nelson that the victory is theirs. The tally has now gone up from 14 considerably. Hardy rises again. He stands and he looks at his chief Nelson again repeats the words, look after Emma, look after Horatia, look after them, Hardy. These men have served together for so many years. And what does Hardy then do? He kneels again and he kisses Nelson, this time on the forehead. Nelson says his famous words, thank God I have done my duty. And his final words to Hardy, God bless you, Hardy. Hardy can take no more. He's the toughest of men, but he can take no more. He turns around and he goes back on deck. And the last man to hear Nelson's dying words is actually Reverend Scott, who puts his ear to Nelson. Do you know what Nelson's final words are? My God and my country. It just shows these are the values that Nelson lived to. These words in today's language in 2023 almost seem old-fashioned, don't they? Our values have changed, perhaps for some anyway. My God and my country. And he dies almost exactly at 4.30. And at that moment, ladies and gentlemen, the battle is over. The battle is over. The guns stop. When the news goes across the fleet, men are utterly shocked. Yes, they've won this incredible victory against all the odds against these fleets that had so much more firepower. But just look at this. I love this one from an anonymous seaman, ladies and gentlemen. Every hero in the fleet shed a tear. Chaps that had fought like the devil cried like a wench. And it goes on. It goes on. There are others. We could go on and on with slide after slide, showing how saddened his men were. Nelson was loved and cared for and respected so much by his men, the men he had inspired but let us consider also, ladies and gentlemen, how the battle finishes at 4.30 on this Monday, the 21st of October, 1805. Look at the British casualties, if you would. 1835, the French and Spanish, 7,500. Nelson has practically destroyed the enemy fleets, as we can see. 17 captured prize ships, 11,000 prisoners, it's a phenomenal fleet, and not one British ship had been destroyed. 
But this isn't quite the end of our story, ladies and gentlemen. Because what now happens is that the most ferocious storm happens. Do you remember that, that prayer that I read to you earlier on the eve of Trafalgar? Nelson said, may humanity be the predominant feature after victory. Do you remember? And I said, let's remember those words. Because what now happens is this. It's more than a storm. Some called it a hurricane. All the ships are being thrown around and all the French and Spanish ships, there are wounded men suffering terribly. And now the British crews go out and they perform with exactly what Nelson had prayed for. Absolute humanity. They go across through these huge seas in rowing boats trying to rescue them. I'm going to read you, if I may, if I may, a couple of writings from what happened. Captain Perno on the Pluton wrote these. He did this about those who made it to the rocks uh, near Cadiz. Very many had perished. The screams of the wounded were appalling. They used the limbs they still had possessed to, to drag themselves across the rocks at night at low tide, indescribably ghastly and harrowing and mostly happening by night. Midshipman Badcock wrote these words as he went from a rowing boat onto one of the French ships to try to bring off the, the wounded. She had lost 400 killed and wounded. Her beams were covered with blood, brains and pieces of flesh and the after part of her decks with wounded, some without legs, some without arms. But there's one more that we should not forget and we should note these words from Lieutenant John Edwards on board the Neptune. May I read this to you? We had to tie the poor mangled wretches around the waist and lower them into a tumbling boat, some without arms, others no legs, lacerated in the most dreadful manner, decks strewn with flesh and blood, and tons of water pouring in through the gun ports with every roll in the huge seas. Ladies and gentlemen, may I share this with you, that for several weeks afterwards, bodies and body parts were washed up 20 miles north onto the beaches at Cape Trafalgar and all along the beaches, at Cadiz. And when those part bodies, when those, the casualties were taken into Cadiz to the hospital, it was said to be the most terrible sight. But many of the Spanish sailors gave great credit to the British for trying to help them. Equally, we know that at the little hospital in Gibraltar, they were full of casualties as well. Debris and body parts all along the beaches. Nelson's body itself is taken on the victory to Rosia Bay at Gibraltar. And we know that the Gibraltar Tribune, ladies and gentlemen, reported what had happened at Trafalgar ten whole days before the Times did in London. And so we think of Gibraltar. We can still go to the little cemetery in Gibraltar today and see the graves of the men who died at Trafalgar. But in England, the news is not known. We know that Lieutenant John Le Ponetier in the HMS Pickle, he races back ahead of the fleet to England and he arrives back, he arrives back uh, on Monday the 4th of November at Falmouth. And when he does, he now uses 19 horses taking two and a half days to get to London to give the news. He does an average of three miles an hour. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you and I, good people, go down to Cornwall uh, on our summer holidays, which I'm sure many of us do, it takes us, what, about three or four hours, maybe? It took him two and a half days, 19 horses in relay. We know he went from Falmouth to Tavistock. He goes here across Dartmoor. He would have seen Brent Tor up in the right, which many of us will know. He goes past two bridges. He goes past Ashburton. He goes past Burton Bradstock, Bridport, Axminster, Dorchester, Honiton, and he arrives back just after midnight on Wednesday the 6th of November into London. He's exhausted. And he arrives just after midnight at the Admiralty in London, which is bathed in thick, heavy fog. And he gives the news, the incredible news, this momentous of all naval battles has been won. But Nelson, the great international hero, has given his life in the process. The news is transmitted.
to William Pitt at Downing Street at 6.30 in the, that morning, and to King George III at Windsor Castle. Both men are speechless. And then what happens? Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to picture the scene. Can we imagine it? At Merton, a few minutes after 9 o'clock, on this Wednesday the 6th of November, there is a long, meandering gravel drive leading up to the main entrance to Merton. And on this drive, a few minutes after nine, is a carriage. It's carrying Mr. Whitby from the Admiralty. We can imagine the sound of gravel being crunched under the carriage wheels. We know that an early autumnal mist was gently rising off the fields on either side of the drive. Inside the carriage, Mr. Whitby is composing himself. How on earth can he bring himself to find the words to give this terrible news to dear Emma Hamilton? The carriage stops at the entrance. Mr. Whitby alights. He is shown inside. A footman shows him up the staircase. Dear Emma is sitting up in her bed. The door is ajar. Mr. Whitby, we know, stands there. He takes off his hat, but no words are spoken. There is, pardon the pun, the most deathly silence. He doesn't know what to say. Emma looks at him. She thinks it's far too early to have news of whatever has happened. And suddenly she screams because she sees the tears in his eyes, and she thinks, my God, the worst has happened. She is utterly, utterly inconsolable. She does not get out of her bed, ladies and gentlemen, for seven whole days. The bed is strewn, strewn, I tell you, with the love letters that she and Nelson had shared together. She said this, she said, my life for me was not worth living. I adored this man. These are almost the same words, ladies and gentlemen, as Victoria used after Prince Albert died. Almost identical words in 1861. But the difference is this. Albert died clutching the fingers of Victoria. Nelson died 750 miles away from the woman he loved in a slaughterhouse from hell. Emma is inconsolable. She doesn't get a penny from the government. Not a penny. Nor does little Horatia. Not a penny. Even though she had served the government well in feeding intelligence back in the years before Trafalgar, back from Naples. She doesn't get a penny. She's written out. She is eschewed by polite society because they knew she'd had a deep affair with Nelson. But love tramples over the rules of society. And anyway, much of establishment was having affairs all over the place anyway. The sheer hypocrisy of it. Emma will die. Ten years later, in penury, above the cobbled streets of Calais, of cirrhosis of the liver. She has ten terrible years. And it is only then, ladies and gentlemen, the little Horatia, who was four years old at the time of Trafalgar, she now sees the letter that Nelson had written to her also on the eve of Trafalgar. She opens the letter in 1815 as her mother lays dying. And she finally realizes, as she reads the letter, now at the age of 14, he was my daddy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Times has reported what has happened. We could spend ages on this one slide. England is in a state of shock. The nation has been rocked and Napoleon's ire has reached the stratosphere. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Today we think of Nelson's column, this wonderful little boy pointing up proudly. Not all little boys are taught to be proud of British heroes these days. It's not so fashionable now. But what is the legacy of Nelson? May I tell you that the makers, the contributors of Harry and Meghan's Netflix, have called for Nelson's column to be pulled down. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not all. We know that the Welsh government, in his wisdom, has called for statues of Nelson to be, and I quote verbatim, hidden away in case they should cause offence. These people are guilty of what Andrew Roberts, the great historian, describes as being 
open to factual distortions. Actually, Roberts has a ruder word. He calls them filthy slurs. They are given one and often false or distorted side of history. The true legacy of Nelson is this. Because Nelson had achieved command of the seas, Wellington is able to bring his army across and begin the Great Peninsula War and, of course, help to liberate Europe, culminating, as we all know, in the Battle of Waterloo on that 18th day of June, 1815. Napoleon will be vanquished because Britain has command of the seas. But there is a second aspect to this that because Britain is now so respected at seas, Britain won't be challenged again until the First World War at sea. Britain really did rule the waves. And that meant that as Professor Neil uh, Ferguson has written in his wonderful book, seminal book, Empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, he says the Navy was able to ensure that across the empire, the empire became the biggest free trade area our planet has ever known just beginning to bring trade and raise millions out of poverty across a third of the world's population. But finally, what about slavery? We know between 1808 and 1860, the Royal Navy, because they had command of the seas and weren't challenged because of everybody remembered what Nelson had done, between 1808 and 1860, they sunk 150 slave ships, not just from Britain, but from many other countries, including, am I allowed to admit this, Barbary pirates from North Africa who over a 300 year spree took over 1 million white, yes, white Europeans, including 100,000 English from the south coast of England, back to North Africa. That's not taught to our children very much. And, and when they sunk those 150 ships up to 1860, they liberated, uh, liberated, made free, 160,000 slaves. In other words, the enforcement of the abolition of slavery was able to take place. Ladies and gentlemen, as we draw to a close, let's just look at these, feast our eyes on these, these words. Professor Andrew Lambert said these words. We can all see them. The art of war at sea had been raised to a level of insight that has never been surpassed. Wonderful words. I, for one, take off my hat and give the greatest respect to Admiral Lord Nelson. And I love these words from Joseph Conrad. How can we sum up Nelson? He brought heroism, heroism into the line of duty. Ladies and gentlemen, I, for one, cannot better those words. Thank you very much. Okay. Philip, thank you very much for bringing a significant moment in our history to life. Very lively indeed. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Is there any connection with... Oh, thank you. Is there any connection between Nelson and Emma and Lymington? Uh, um, is there any connection and Lymington? I'm sure there is. Uh, certainly, he, he visited uh, Cornwallis at Milford, and uh, at least some of us believe that. Um, but all over the country, we find pubs, hotels, street names, places from Yarmouth to the Isle of Wight. I was in a pub on the Isle of Wight, the Spyglass. Nelson was there with Emma. And so whether directly Lymington, I, we have Chris Hobby here. Chris, may I ask you, are you familiar with Nelson with Emma in Lymington? Because you're an expert on this. Chris, any thought on that? Um, I wouldn't think so, but I think your general comment is probably true. Yes. He, he, certainly, he was just about everywhere, so I wouldn't be surprised. I think we're all exhausted. Can we pass the microphone to this gentleman? What happened to his daughter? To Horatia. Yes. I'm very pleased to tell you that she lived a long and goodly life. She went back to Norfolk and she had a reasonably happy life and lived to a good age. So that's some good news. I've got one. How did the letters get from the Atlantic back to London? His letters to Emma. 
they had frigates all the time, faster frigates like Captain uh, Blackwood and the Uralis, speeding back, taking the mail back, and indeed love letters to their loved ones on the eve of Trafalgar. So there was a constant mail going to and fro, of course. My godfathers. Can we give him a... <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a huge honour. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. Philip, thank you so much. And um, we look forward to seeing you all at the Christmas party on December the 1st, when we will be telling you about what we're doing next year. Thank you. <laughs>